All right, we are back. This is the Just Offside podcast, and me and Mike today are joined by a very, very special guest. Um, he is the director of player development for Brantham Soccer Club. He's been a performance analyst for Canada Soccer, both with the men's and women's uh, teams. And but most importantly, he was a former coach of mine back at, over a decade ago, which is crazy to think with the Ontario Soccer Program and the provincial program. So, Joy Lombardi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for, for coming on today. Thanks, Keith and Mike. Uh, really looking forward to the uh, the next hour and going through some some good questions. Yes, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, man, obviously it's been a crazy, crazy year with the pandemic and COVID-19. So, gonna, I just wanted you to tell us how, like, behind the scenes, what's been going on at the club in Brampton and kind of the kind of the hurdles you guys had to get over this last uh, past year. Yeah, it was a massive, uh, massive hurdle. Um, first off was there's so much unpredictability. Um, in terms of what was going to happen, timelines, you know, we're so used to having um, things in place six months in advance in terms of the yeah. uh, the summer, fall, winter season. So um, that's been a different reality. Um, you know, the, the, I'll, I'll start off with the most important part for me, which is player development. Yeah. We had to adjust our thinking because we couldn't do in-person training. So how we brought in virtual models online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Game IQ sessions, which keep you know, you're probably like, oh, geez, Joey with the video. <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot of those, a lot of those sessions, I remember. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, so, what were you, like, what kind of stuff were you doing with them since they couldn't be training over the year? Like, what stuff were you guys be doing with the kids? So, we were doing uh, one day a week fitness. Okay. Then we did two times a week uh, ball mastery. Okay. Uh, which was like ball manipulation, change of direction, turns. Then we did... Uh, wall work where them against the wall to simulate passing. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Love that. Then we did every Friday, we would do like a four corner webinar, bring in uh, guest speakers. We had Oscar. Oscar Cardon was one. Yeah, I saw that. Coco. Uh, Coco, yes. Exactly. And then um, university coaches, sometimes I delivered, brought in a couple of national staff to come speak to the players. So oh, yeah. give them that sort of... Um, education that you necessarily can't do during the year because you're so busy yeah right and so you guys got back to the field uh, this week was it yeah first day was monday um following the government protocols groups of 10 uh, yeah. technical work uh, just to get them back some fitness integrated and uh so far can't complain everybody's happy to be back it's yeah it's I'm really sure. no it's been a long long haul so i feel so bad for the kids not being able to be out there in the fields but what, uh, yeah, imagine, so what the, imagine missing a season at that age right? of youth soccer yeah. at that age is unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. Like that's what you, that's what you live for in the summer. Everybody's waiting for the actual season, all the winter training preparation and all of that. And then can't have any of it. It's I couldn't imagine at that age. No, never, ever. So Joey, talk about us, uh, about your role and how long have you been with Brampton now? soccer? I went into the role january 2020 so oh so you oh per perfect, so perfect timing yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been a whole you know it's basically been COVID. i had three months of normality and then it's been managing the COVID. and um wow yeah yeah so i'll start with the first three months because that's probably more of what yeah so the role what do you is. yeah what you will be doing in a normal setting yeah so um what i how what i first did was a lot of coach education so we did um a great workshop early in January where we brought all the coaches in and we're going for our framework, our identity, how we play. Um, so the starting point for me is coach education because there's only so many places you as a director can be. So yeah, I want to make sure the coaches, we all have an aligned vision and, um, and we've continued on that path. Even through COVID, we've done a lot of virtual meetings and brought in European coaches in to come speak to our staff. We've done a lot of work there. Um, and then for me, I try to every week uh, pick one area of the club. So OPDL, our competitive rep, or our grassroots. Okay. And then I'll focus only on that stream for that week. So I'll go to the practices. I'll okay. The practices. I'll design sessions for them um, and really try to help and support hand, like with a hands-on approach. Yeah. Uh, I love being on the field and, yeah. and at the same time, no better way to help the coaches than being there with them. Exactly. Exactly. I was going to say, when you talk about like coach education and like you're around them and all of that, do you kind of get like a feel or like a filter kind of of like, oh, this coach maybe doesn't know as much as he should or like up to the standard of you, you'd expect? Or are you kind of like weighing it out then to see like gaps maybe in what they do know? 
it helps. It helps when they got to put a coach development plan together for them, yeah. to help them bridge gaps and, and understand their um, their strengths. Some are more the methodology, very strong mm -hmm. organization. Some are more like uh, very good with the um, the sessions, like just running the sessions, good yeah. information. Uh, some are more fitness based. They like to do a little bit more yeah. physical where I like more with the ball always and technical tactical. So um, I've learned a lot for, for those situations where I'm there right. working side by side. Okay. Nice. So take us back. When did uh, when did coaching become something, you know, you wanted to do? And like, where did you where did you even start? Where were, you, where were your first coaching experiences? So it kind of just happened naturally. Um, yeah. My dad was my coach as a kid. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So he coached me growing up. And then once he was done my age group, he went and coached a younger group of boys. Um, they were born in 1989. So Joey Mello's age. Um, yeah. That group. And um, he says, why don't you come help me out? You can do some of the demos and run some yeah. of the practice. So I went out and I'm like, wow, this is fun. You know, yeah. kids, kids are developing. And then I said, you know what? It's time to do my own team. And um, I took over the 93 boys in Brampton East. Okay, yeah. I remember that team. Jay Chapman was there. On yeah. That. Tristan Jackman and, and quite a few other boys. Tristan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Jay played up. Because Jay's a year young, younger than us, right? That's right. He's a 94. Yeah, he's, he's a 94. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, and how, and how old were you then when you started with that Brampton East? I must have been 23, 24. You're young. Yeah. Wow. So, that was the best pitch at Ontario at the time. It was <laughs> Victoria Park. Yeah. Yeah. It still is amazing. I yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. I um, remember going there. I loved playing there. That pitch was incredible. I loved being there. It just brought back major nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> you know what helped me, Keith, with the coaching? Yeah. Uh, the Ontario soccer made it uh, mandatory. You had to have your, what they called senior level at the time. Okay. And when I went to my first course, guys, I love the game. Um, to sit in a room and talk soccer all day, I was like, "This is amazing! This is better, better than being in normal school." <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got, I got in love with that part, the education. So then I did my B license. Okay. And I think snowball there, Ontario soccer, and and. Yeah. So when did you get started uh, with OSA Ontario soccer? Two thousand six September. 2006. Who was the what? Who was the first team that you coached there? I had the '93 girls, which would have been uh, Diamond Simp Diamond Simpson. I remember, yeah, yeah, Louis okay. Cass. And they were 14, so that, that's when we were 14. Yeah, that's the yeah. first year when we had Ruben, right? Yeah, and you. Yes. And then you transitioned over, so we can get we got to get into some stories from our time together for sure. <laughs> yes. But I no for the joy. You, I remember starting at, um, at with provincial program was with, with you and Ruben. And you guys are like the first coaches to really start breaking down the game for us and giving us these videos, breaking down film. So um, that's one of my biggest memories from development at a young age. So you guys really kind of changed that for us, kind of started seeing the game in a different way. Around four, I'd say around four, for me, it was around 14, 15, definitely. But I remember you specifically, those meetings you used to have up in, in the meeting room all the time, breaking down film, yeah. Some definitely some good times and obviously, Getting to uh, travel. Where did we go? France the first year we were with you? France and uh, California the second year. California the second year. But yeah, so we got to experience a lot of amazing things. I remember the France trip was really eye-opening for a lot of us, I think, to see, obviously, the level of play we were. I mean, it didn't feel like we were too far off of guys over there in France. We're, we're playing these clubs, these academies. I think it was, uh, who did we play? Xur, I think we played La Harve, if I remember correctly. And Lons was And Lons, Lons, right, too. So yeah, we got to see and kind of me measuring stick at that point to see where we were at. So it was really good, really fun. And obviously too, I remember uh, we got to go to what? Um, the friendly we got to go see. France, England. France, England. Yeah, Stade yeah. de France was amazing. That was my first like professional game I've ever seen in my life. So I was like, wow. Wow, 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 yeah. But uh, tell us, yeah, tell me about some of your memories from, uh, from us, our crazy group, our 93s. Um, first off, to this day, one of my favorite coaching experiences. Um, yeah. you know, been fortunate to travel and, and work with a lot of groups, but that, that one really is a special one. Um, first off, the the connection of the group. Yeah. Felt like a family, felt like a, 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 a you know, when people say team, felt like that. Yeah. Like a real team team. And uh, everybody had their back through the good and bad. And um, I, I just love, I love that about the group. Everybody was committed. Um, 
some good memories. Jeez. Um, I remember, I'll, I'll use one. I remember a uh, national championship is more ba- at the back end of the yeah. experience. We were um, playing BC and it was a must win game for us. We had to win. You remember we were. Oh yeah. 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 Half time. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't play well in the first half. And yeah. I remember the halftime talk. You know, we had to really commit players for. I think we ended up having only two at the back because we were so <laughs> attack minded. Yeah. And then we scored in the last minute of the game. It was uh it was I think the second of the third minute of extra time. Yeah. Abraham. Abraham. Amazing. Showed, we fought to the end, just our, how we developed that mentality and not give up. Yeah. Push right to the end. I love that. And then that transcended in the final game where you know, we were down a goal and we, we ended up scoring at the written, you know, I think we right 10 minutes end. left and right at the end of that, yeah, yeah. the mental strength of the group. And um, so that was, that's one memory that, uh, that really stood out. Um, <laughs> one funny one is uh, <laughs> I remember uh, being in California and uh, you remember Dave, our manager. <laughs> oh yeah. I can never forget Dave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dave has this great idea after one of our games that we have to go to the mall. <laughs> mall just happened to be an hour and a half away from our hotel <laughs> you know coach said you geez you should be recovering and now <laughs> so i remember we get to the mall I'm like okay guys we're behind schedule <laughs> everybody must be on time like i don't want if you're late you're not playing the next game sure enough three guys got stuck at one of the counters at a store <laughs> yeah i think it was that i think it was that was it steph i think it was steph Lugovic, parm maybe parm, parm and i think it was joey journo Yes, yeah, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I remember that. yeah. The, so those those poor guys. The next day, had to get up at seven a.m. Go running with me. <laughs> Didn't play the next game, and uh, but you know what? They never complained once. Yeah. I, remember, I remember the parents coming. Joey, let if we got your back. If you need to <laughs> be hard on, I'm like, wow, <laughs> that would not happen. Uh, I don't know if that would happen these days, but. <laughs> Oh, that was funny. No, it was fun. We had a good group. We had a great time. And obviously, we had that fun. But I think we always knew when to like get serious. And once we're on the pitch, you know, it's that we're prepared. It's, this is work. Got to get to work. So, now those are fun times. But, yeah, definitely the – for me, it's definitely that championship. Because we obviously lost when we were 14 at Nationals to Quebec, too. Uh, the, right at the end, I remember it was a free kick that we lost to at the last second. And then – so, obviously, 16, we kind of got that revenge against them, which was amazing. Amazing, amazing feeling. Keith, uh, one last thing was, you know what else I remember? All yeah. those old sessions. Oh my goodness. Yeah, actually we got to talk about that too. Cause I remember <laughs> we would, Pav, you don't know, like we would coat like in the winter in Vaughn, we'd be outside. Sometimes we have to shovel off the field as a warm up to go play and like, at, oh, you know what? Great OSA, warm up. <laughs> yeah, you know what OSA have that, that, if you're coming out the change room with the back pub and you're walking, and there's that big wall before you're walking up to the big field. Yeah. And you like you think it's not too cold, but you get around that wall and just the wind would hit you all the time. <laughs> Be like, oh my god! And I still remember, Joe. I don't know if you remember. I think it was 15 when we were 15. I think uh, Daniel came for uh, he was try- trialing with us for a bit, and he came and uh, he thought we were training inside <laughs> in like February, so he had no no under armor, no nothing. He's outside. He's just freezing, freezing cold. Under armor was hilarious. We always talk about that, me and him. We had the cold, but it made us toughen us up. Definitely toughen us up. Definitely did. We even would shovel, like we would go on and shovel the field. I have the boys, we'd shovel the, just the 18 yard box, play as many as we could fit in that space. And, uh, <laughs> and just, yeah, just to get a session in. Yeah. But now we were there four times a week. So, yeah, we were there. Was it four? Yeah, two times during the week, two on uh, the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. So, yeah, myself and Arthur, thank God. That both our dads took us uh, once uh, or took two times a week each and got us up there. But no, those are good, amazing soccer memories for me. So um, kind of let's take it into the what stuff you've done with Canada soccer. So you've been a performance analyst over the last few years. Kind of break that down for us and uh, what you've been yeah, doing. I'm really, both. really interested on this side. Really, yeah. Okay. Just break us down and see what's that all about. Yeah, yeah. So that's the next. It's almost like a storyline because I went from Ontario soccer to to Canada soccer, and um, I was first with the women's program, and the role there was um, regional program director, and I was analyst slash assistant with some, with the youth teams, um, the 17s and 20s, and a little bit with the 15s. 
And uh, my role then was to implement regional centers across Canada. So these were best with best environments, BC, Ontario, Quebec, the Atlantic provinces, and then the prairies. And uh, huge project because we didn't have any in place when I came in. Yeah. And my role was just to create that alignment. And now we've, if I'm not mistaken, there's still eight centers okay. as of today um, under that under that Rex model. And um, so that was one of my system building roles. And then with the teams, the analyst role is um, it's all encompassing. It's um, opposition scouting. Yeah. It's uh, team analysis, so your own team analysis, your individual player analysis, scouting of players statistical analysis, yeah. um, trends. So looking at your data and trying to identify trends where, where we've improved, where we're uh, still have some gaps to fill um, and creating those sort of analytical processes for, for us as coaches to, to use to, I, I always say it doesn't tell you what to do. It just informs you in terms of decision-making. Yeah. yeah. The two blended a good eye with good data you know, it makes an informed decision. And uh, really that was my role was to provide key information to help us elevate our game and our performance. Okay. And so you've done that both with uh, the senior men's and women's as well? Yeah. So Keith, I did five years with the women. And then I, you know, when coach John Herman took over the men's program, he asked me to come alongside with him. Okay. I was, I was there at the, right at the beginning. So I was there right, right as soon as that move happened. That move that that happened quickly, and um, you know what? A, what an amazing time! Got to yeah. work side by side with John, um, especially during that initial phase, getting to know the team, the immersion, the first camp. Um, boy, we spent a lot of time scouting, looking at yeah. players, seeing what 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 was out there across the globe, and um, you know that was really the the starting point for what you know now they've been able to uh, achieve today getting to the final round of world cup qualifying you're really going to make a push for 2022 which yeah it's a, a incredible growth for for canadian soccer i guess we can get into that a little bit now yes what a, it's honestly it's amazing to see obviously the youth that is in that team as well as the experience but if you want to just touch on kind of the youth uh, that talent we got with like obviously alfonso and john david and all these guys coming on coming through the ranks I think um, I agree. It's, it's it's cool to see them playing at a high level, getting success at a high level. Johnny David winning League One, in yeah. France. Alfonso with Bayern, all the trophies they've they've won, and um, you know some of the veterans: Atiba, Scott Arfield, Kyle Lahren, David Weatherspoon. Um, yeah, so like they got they got a good mix of guys with experience, obviously, and guys the youth with coming through, which is good. And I think they got a real shot. You, you know, Keith, with the youth. Um, if you look at the level of club that they're at, again, Johnny, Alfonso, Liam Miller yeah. at, at Liverpool, Theo Corbino over at uh, at Wolves, uh, Ustaki was playing at Pakish Ferreira in, in top league in Portugal yeah. and, and many others. Um, you know, to get that experience week in, week out at a, yeah. at a pro level, you know, that's helping our players, you know, reach that standard, which that standard is to now get us over that, that hump and qualify. And, yeah. I think their daily environments are really supporting um, the work that the national team uh, is doing. So, how did they take to uh, to John? Obviously, John has had amazing success with the women's women's team. How did all the guys all uh, take to him? And I also heard I talked to a few of them. They've loved him. What I've heard from Daniel and Ashton and some of those guys. So, he's um, just a, a good human being. He's um, you know well-rounded you know you, you look at him as a coach he's sound on the tactics great with the man management great motivator good at setting a structure so he's, he's you know he, he he's so well-rounded and uh you know that, i mean that's that's one of his biggest strengths is that he he can adapt very well in, into different environments and he adapted so well from making it that that move from the women's side to the men's yeah. side because of his uh, his profile as, as a coach and, and as a system builder um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say one, one big thing that I love about John is he always takes time to talk to you as an individual. If you have anything, his door is always open. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's something that the players are definitely, um, likened to because they know they can go talk to him about anything, um, whether it's personal football related. Perfect, perfect. That's a big step. I was going to say, um, 
with John and when you're doing like the analysis of everything, is he kind of directing you in what to look for and what to search for and find? Or is that kind of completely up to you in that regard of like your role? Because like if certain things like scouting wise or the attacking side are filling those gaps or like making those connections, is that on you or is he kind of leading that way of going, okay, I want you to kind of find this, this and this. So he would set the framework. We have uh, an identity of how we want to play. Um, okay. And then based on that identity, when we're doing our game review, I'd be analyzing those aspects to see how effective we were or, or ineffective and, and, and why we were ineffective in those in those scenarios, in those moments of the game. When it came to opposition scouting, um, we always had a blueprint. Um, and then that blueprint was how the opponent would attack, how they defend, set plays, key players, opportunities where we can hurt them, threats where they may hurt us. And then that'd be um, pulled together and compiled in some visuals, um, a lot of video, animated video to highlight the different yeah. areas. And then that would then be condensed to a player version so that we could give that to the to the players and help with the preparation for a game. Okay. Now, how long would that whole process possibly like take? Like say if you're at like a major tournament and you're preparing or getting ready, like how long would that take you on a, just for, prepare for like one game or one opposition? So if I had to use the Gold Cup, I'd say yeah. for the Gold Cup, we would prepare all three group opponents and we would go into so much detail. I'd say we'd at least do a month, maybe even more than that of prep. Wow. So then when we're in tournament, it's just, looking at their more recent games to see if there's any um, changes or adaptations that they've made. Yeah. Um, and then update our blueprint. And then at the same time, while the, our group phase is going on, we're scouting the other groups to prepare yeah. for the quarterfinals. So we would possibly play, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. It's fascinating, that side of the game and just being able to break it down and know your opponent so much, like so well before you can even face them. It's such an advantage. Yeah. It's amazing. So are you going to be doing uh, anything with the women, women's uh, with the Olympics or anything? No, right now, right now, right now, um, I've not made any any commitments um, just because of the whole COVID scenario. Yeah, right. And, and the club having to get back up and running, I've, I've made that a priority for for the time being. But I'm still in touch with the staff. Yeah. Um, on a on a weekly basis, so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm. You know, would I love to go back and do some work with them? Absolutely. And we've always left the door open. So, because when do uh, let me start next month? End of next month? Yeah, I believe, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, end of next month. Yeah, end of next month. So, It'll be good. Obviously, can get to watch Canada Women's again at the World Cup. But let's get back a little bit to um, on the development side with youth. What is, what is your views with development and versus results? Obviously, as even I've started, I've coached obviously in the last maybe five years ago, I had a youth 13, 14 boys that I coached without in Niagara and kind of what's your viewpoint on development versus results at the young age and obviously parents get involved with a lot of stuff and wanting to win games and all that kind of thing. It's an excellent question. And it's one again too, in my, my role comes up, comes up quite regularly. So how, how I'll look at it is, so let's say you have a player and that player pathway in your club starts as young as the age of four yeah, and ends at the age of 18. So you'd say, okay, well, there's a foundation phase that needs to be established. And that foundation phase is the skills the player needs to play the game, the game understanding of the principles of how to play, attacking, defending, transition, and helping them to develop a passion and love for the game so that they want to continue on that long journey and put the extra work in and all that stuff you need to be a high performing athlete so that's the foundation that foundation i'd say again depending on when the player starts let's say um needs to be set probably by 13 14 a good foundation yeah so then at 14 15 16 provincial starts national youth teams tfc academy yeah. and all those other high performance programs and if that foundation's solid that player could make that progression up so that requires a lot of training, trial and error, ups and downs. Um, they're really getting out of their comfort zone. If they're too worried about the results at that foundation phase, yeah. they're not going to take the necessary risks. They're not going to experiment. They're not going to try to do a Maradona turn and all those, you know, yeah. skills that, you know, high performing players can execute on demand under pressure. So um, 
that's the problem if you focus on results at that foundation phase and then all of a sudden they're 14 and we say geez now they need to learn skills principles all yeah these well, it's too late now because you're you're trying to reprogram them from those bad habits at a young age now when they're older it's even harder so um that's the way i look at it is let's make sure we get the foundation right and then we can start to talk about you know performing competing at the right time and um no matter what age you know you're, you're always developing um but as you get older, you know, you start to move into high performing programs. There's an expectation to perform, compete and, you know, go, go, go give your best foot forward in the competition. But, um, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo is still training every day. Yeah. Working hard, Messi exactly. still putting his craft. So it's, you know, you, the, the, the development uh, process is always on a continuum. Yeah. So there's all the, sorry, go Yeah. On. Yeah. Do you notice that like if, children or like younger players so say you start with that u4 and you're going up to the u18 and that's that whole model it'd be a ideal situation to have a player start with your club at u4 and work their way completely up and not make any changes whether it's city wise or club wise are you do you notice any players that come in maybe at like u10 or u14 that come into the club that maybe does, don't have that framework and then you have to kind of see that or is like is it tough to try and retain kids in the club and not let them move um hey i think that's a good measure for the club to say we're doing a good job our retention yeah. rates are high i think it's yeah. a great 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 measuring tool um i'd say the soccer landscape is so expansive now there's so many opportunities or or, or entities that are running programs so um um I think I think it's not so much that it's hard to keep your your players in the club. I think it's we just got to keep making sure we're, you know, at the cutting edge of what we do and giving right. the best programs to ensure that the players stay with us. If we're if we're not doing that, then you know I mean the player the players got tons of an abundance of options. So um, I think I mean it's more um, yeah it, it's it can be challenging, but at the same time I think it's. It's, it's healthy. It's a healthy challenge because it keeps us on the front foot and making sure we're not um, slipping in any areas in our program. Right. Yeah, I saw that. I read that um, your club, Brampton, as well, with like Pickering and Tecumseh and Hamilton kind of had a little a, agreement on sharing some resources and sharing some things during like the COVID time and being able to just actually like share what worked or what didn't work with the with the kids. So I think like, Obviously, like you said, you want to be the leader in it. But if you're sharing and everybody's kind of on the same page length, then it's all good for the youth development. And all yeah, the kids then we're all winning, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's kind of my um, uniqueness is because I come from Ontario, Canada soccer. I still kind of look at every everything in totality. Yeah. And yeah. I want to help. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So let's um let's get in some little quick hitters before we get out of here. So you want to talk about for you, Joe? Who uh what league or what team do you really do you follow? I'm a Juventus fan. Oh boy, uh, set it steady on <laughs> my team since I was a kid. Uh, Roberto Baggio was my was and is my idol. As you can see, I got yeah. in the back and um yeah. So that's that's my favorite club, favorite team. Is that the '96 or the '94 kit? So that's the that kid there with his name on his Brescia, his last club. Oh, okay, okay. okay. And then right beside it on the side there is uh, the '94 kit. Italy. Oh, amazing! Yeah, that's a beautiful kit. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really cool. With the uh, logo embedded in the fabric. Yeah. Okay, one other one I want to add. What uh, who, what coaches do you kind of mirror yourself off of and or look at in the world game? You were like, I I really admire Pep Guardiola. Um, what I admire about him is that he's moved across three different clubs in three different countries, but yet he's been able to implement um, a clear philosophy, identity, yeah. style play that, you know, is built on solid principles of possession, um, movement, uh, speed of play, um, high level of skill, um, pressing. Um, and I just I admire how he's, again, been able to implement that sort of positional play concept. Mm -hmm three different clubs with success yeah yeah it's incredible so he's he's my he's one um Mourinho I respect for his method I think he's 
a method guy and he's, you know, he's a different profile coach. And I think he changed uh, how, how people look at coaches because he went through an academic yeah. Route, yeah. formation rather than just the typical former player. Again. Former he, player. Yeah, exactly. So he was able to integrate his the science of the game. Um, and some of his stuff's really, really interesting. Um, Jurgen Klopp for his intensity. Mm hmm. I uh, love his passion, his way of motivating his team, how he gets them to work at 100 miles per hour uh, across the season. You know, the heavy metal football, <laughs> he called it. So I, I admire that that piece too. So that, those would be my top three. Top Tuchel, three, yeah. Tuchel, I, 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 I'm really yeah. liking the Tuchel too. Obviously now seeing him in England, mm -hmm. I've been able to see more of how his team's playing his three box, three formations, quite, quite an interesting structure too. Joey, I knew you were going to say Pep Guardiola. <laughs> I knew it. So you know why? I watched their um, your webinar for League, League One, and the first thing that came up was the culture and setting up the culture for the club and knowing that. And I just knew that you are going to ch somehow <laughs> relate it back to Pep and La Masia and Barcelona and all of that. So I, I had the feeling for that. Did you get a chance to watch those, uh, those Prime, those documentaries, the City One or the Tottenham? Yeah, I watch both of them. I watch both of them. Amazing that, uh, you know, people like us can get access to those sort of behind. Right? Oh, my goodness. And it's your boys this year as well. Juve. Yeah, Juventus. yeah, it's Juve. It's Juve. It's going to be Pirlo, Pirlo's uh, Juve from this past That's going to be an interesting one. His one and done year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Are you happy <laughs> with him leaving or are you, are you a little bit sad? I'm, um, I, 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 I'll say disappointed because... It was always going to be a risk putting there with, you know, it being his first. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. So if they weren't willing to give him the time, knowing that it, it, it could be an up and down year, then they maybe should have thought more deeply about the original appointment. And um, unless they, again, if they were committed to it, then give him a second year. Yeah. Especially a year where it was COVID. And yeah. A few it's players a were in the season, Dybala and Ronaldo and a few, you know, so... Yeah, I just wish they gave him some time. Yeah. All right, next one we got. Euro, who's your Euro pick? Oh. Okay, so <laughs> I'll say two. So I always got to say Italy's one. <laughs> of course. They look good, though. They're flying at the minute. They look good. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. They played well, you know, scoring goals, defending. Not conceding, yeah well-organized attacking football so I'm, i've been impressed with them and then france i, I have to go yeah. france. So, so so deep too what what a, what a team well well-rounded you yeah. know they got guys coming off the bench that you know are world-class players and um and they got a world-class coach i i i they shops um yeah shops a world-class coach too i have a feeling i don't know but i feel like rabio is just sticks out in that french squad I don't like him. I don't like. I, I feel like he's not, and I feel like Giroud is going to start the next game, and he, Benzema is going to get the bench. Well, they got to win. Yeah, they have to win. Yeah, they do. They do. It's a big game. Yeah. And Italy, if Italy get Verratti back and they keep scoring goals, I think they got a shot. Yeah. Yeah. I like their chances. All right. Okay, I'm excited. I'm interested to hear your answer for this, but I want you, if you can, um, your best 11 of players you've coached. If you can pick a best 11. Oh, that's a hard, that's a real hard one. <laughs> oh, geez. I is, Keith, is Keith not in your team sheet? <laughs> I got so many. That's a hard one. You've, yeah, because you've probably coached a lot. <laughs> we'll give you, we'll give you, uh, we'll give you 11 and give us five subs. <laughs> Keith, really, Keith really wants to be on this team. No, I don't need to be on the team. I just want to know because I don't even know all the players he's coached. They might say a name. I'll be like, oh, I didn't even know you coached that guy. This guy. Wow. So, um, okay, I'll keep I'll keep it to head coach. Okay, so I'll keep it. Yeah. Head okay. Coach. Yeah. I'll keep okay. the head coaching. Head coaching uh, only. Um. Okay. Goalkeeper. Hmm. I'm gonna go Ricky. Okay, yeah, Ricky, yeah. Ricky Gomez. Ricky Gomez. You remember Ricky? Yeah. 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 Because yeah. he played out in, uh, he was out in, Port is he still in Portugal? I believe he is, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think he's still in Portugal. Yeah, okay, Ricky, yeah. Go to Ricky. I haven't seen Ricky in forever. 
He's Kitchener guy, wasn't he? Yeah, Kitchener. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go Ricky right back. I'm going to go Surieka. Surieka, yeah, I remember that name. Yeah. Center backs. I'm going to go with the Twin Towers, Aaron and Daniil. Okay, yeah. Schneebly. Schneebly. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, left back. That's, uh, that's going to be an interesting one. Left back. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think of our left backs. We, we had Morel. We had Jordan Morel. Oh, yeah, Jordan. Yeah. He did, he did really well. Nice play, play he, he went to play on, yeah, he went to do on, uh, play an old BL, yeah. Yeah. So, you know what? I'll put I'll put him there. Yeah. I'll put him there. Okay, midfielders. Jesse Fleming. Yeah. Sarah Stratagakis. Those two are, yeah. are, are my number one and two. My holding midfielder. It's not pure holding midfielder, but I'm going to put Oscar there. Yeah, yeah. Oscar for sure. Engine. Was running all game. Yeah. That's a good one. Up front. Up front. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I love the ass. This is good. Uh, <laughs> Gets you thinking too. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chloe Lacasse was good at 14. That was my first team. Yeah. Um, Donzo was fantastic when we were a kid. When Who's that? Abraham Donzo was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Oh, yeah. That national championship. He, he really yeah. was, uh, He played really well. It's like um, a man of months, boys. You be up there too, keep on not just saying that. Um, Arthur, going back to the midfield, I loved Arthur too. Arthur was, yeah. Parm, Parm was excellent too. Vukovic, Steph. 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 Yeah. I know I'm going yeah. around there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. won't, won't make you. So I, I go, you. I go, I go, if I had to go with, um, to, to, to condense it, I go. You're in there, Steph's in there, Chloe's in there, Donzel's in there. Okay, yeah, no, I agree. In that front three. I agree. <laughs> Put yourself in there, Keith. That's the pressure. <laughs> that's the pressure. No, Joey's coached a lot of, lot of talented young players, so, no, that's cool. Um, um, do you have a favorite coaching memory? Obviously, you talked about kind of with soccer, but even football like memory. Um, outside of my own, own experience, like work-wise, um, Italy winning the World Cup was sick. <laughs> <Wait, laughs> <up there. laughs> I said this to Keith last night. I said he's gonna say oh six for Italy World Cup with. Yeah, that's a common one. Um another one was ninety six Juve. Okay. They won the Champions League against Ajax in shootout. That was one. Um and then my own personal coaching moments. Um I'd say, well that that old nine. Yeah. Nine national championship. Was was a big one for me. You know, was another good one, Keith, that we had was yeah. before we went to Quebec. Yeah, yeah, yes, I remember that. I know it was a friendly series, but because the group had just lost to Quebec, we lost week, but we killed them, didn't we? Four, I think it was four nothing at home. Yeah, 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 yeah. We were ready. I remember that. Yeah, we were ready. <laughs> we, were, we, were we were firing. I uh, just yeah, yeah. We were good. It's like everything just clicked. That it was one of those yeah. games where everything just clicked from the first to the last minute. That that's a great one. Um, win, winning national championship at home, in front of my yeah. parents. That was a cool one. Um, national team, geez, tons of them. Getting yeah. out of the group phase in 2014, U17 World Cup with right. 17 girls. Um, the qualification tournaments. Uh, being uh, a support staff at the Women's World Cup in 2015, um, being around the Olympic groups, um, Gold Cup last year with, uh, sorry, 2019 with the men's team. Mm -hmm. That's another good one. Um, I'd say too, Keith, one, one great moment was the first, the first camp with John with the men's program. We had New Zealand. Okay, yeah. You know, first camp, first experience to, to get a W on our first yeah. camp was, was cool. And just that way everybody connected together was yeah. a great moment. Cool. All right, last one here. Let's see if you could uh, a player, pick a best uh, five-a-side team, all-time players. Four plus a goalie or five plus a goalie? Let's do five plus a goalie. Okay, so 
Uh, Messi, Ronaldo. I'm, 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 I'm going to go pure attacking here. <laughs> so Messi, Ronaldo, Pelé, Maradona. And I'm going to throw one defensive player. Actually, no. I'm going to throw Baggio. I have to throw Baggio in there. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, Baggio has to fit in there. So I'm going to go all, all attacking. Uh, we'll have so much ball possession that we'll dominate. <laughs> and then I'm going to throw Buffon in that to uh, okay. <laughs> make sure we're solid between the five. <laughs> if I had to add an extra, another one more player, it be, uh, would have been Maldini. Okay. Um, you can come off the bench just yeah. in case. Yeah. When we're closing the game, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, you need to close, close, close the game. game. Yeah, you can throw him in. <laughs> That's All right. That's, I think that's pretty much what we had for today. But I'm really, uh, really, really appreciate you coming on and kind of giving us some insight of what you got going on right now. And obviously, it was good to see you and good to talk to you. I know the last time I've seen you in person. So, um, but no, thank you. Really appreciate it. No, yeah, much appreciated. Thank you for coming on. My, my pleasure, guys. And uh, let's uh, let's see. We mean we do something again in the future. Um, yeah, hopefully in person and we can do something and sit down because Mike is in, I don't even know, Mike's in the UK. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm in London. I've been yeah, here for the last couple London. of years. Incredible, awesome, awesome. And uh, I guess you're going through the whole um, return to normality post COVID. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We've, we're like a couple of weeks ahead, and um, to be honest, here it's been like no one really is caring all that much, or nobody's abiding to the rules as much. But we've slowly opened back up, and things have kind of been a little bit normal for us. But um, yeah, it's been strange. It's been strange, definitely. The fact that like I was going to football matches regularly. I'm an Arsenal fan, and I live like <laughs> ten minutes from the Emirates. I was going to matches regularly and just going to even like championship games and League One games, and um, that all just stopped, and it was just horrible. The last football match I saw, I think, was Arsenal Sheffield United. It was like a nil-nil, <laughs> awful. T- oh no, actually, it was Everton Chelsea. 4-1 win for Chelsea or 4-0 win for Chelsea was just brutal. So you got to get back. We'll be back. Stadiums are open soon. It's yeah. almost there. Think, think think, about when you go back to the Emirates since full capacity. How, yeah, how amazing that that's going to be. The ticket, getting a ticket is going to be tough, but <laughs> yeah. it's going to be, uh, well, yeah, that'll be an experience. Oh, yeah, definitely. I can't wait for the moment. I think september or august when the season back up should be at full capacity which is nice that's what's amazing about seeing like budapest and seeing the pushka arena full yesterday and just seeing like an actual stadium full is so surreal I'm sure the players miss it too like can imagine they got a draw they got a draw against france i know if they're if they're behind closed doors who knows if that happens Exactly. I remember in the All or Nothing uh, Tottenham documentary because they had, you know, when uh, Spurs were going for their uh, return to play. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Mourinho would tell the players, hey, the game is important because they would sometimes maybe shut off because it's no fans. Yeah. It's more like a friendly a scrimmage than, than a normal game. So he's trying to put that pressure on them. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely different. Definitely it's different. Yeah. No, but uh, yeah, thanks again, Joey. This has been another episode of the Just Offside podcast with myself, Keith McCubia, and, and me, Michael Pavella. We're signing off. We'll see you guys soon. <laughs>